chapter 26. Let's get back in the Word. I, I, I kind of miss, you know, following, you know, these, these people we've become so acquainted with as we're going through the book of Genesis. And just to bring you up to date and remind us what's going on, Abraham at this point has passed from the scene, having turned his inheritance over to Isaac. And Isaac obtains a great thing in, as the Word says, if, you know, a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. And, uh, you know, I think us men, we need to be reminded of that. You know, what a good thing, what a great thing that the, that the Lord would give us a wife to take care of. And, and it comes with a great deal of responsibility, and we need to embrace that. And, and Isaac, the Lord gives Isaac a wife f- from among Abraham's people, from among his own people, named Rebekah. And then, you know, we remember from, from two weeks ago, chapter 25, Rebekah becomes pregnant, and... Uh, and actually, it's so funny because the Lord, in His great wisdom, that it becomes very, as we go through this message, we'll see, it becomes very confusing to us as to why the Lord would allow this. But she has twins. You know, again, the Lord is preserving His promise. He's, he's bringing forth a fulfillment of His prophetic promises and that He would make Abraham a great nation. And that the, the nation of people He was going to bring forth would be a blessing to the whole world. How do we know that that happened? Well, we have had our Messiah. He's been here. You know, he, he died on the cross and paid the price for our sins, and that's the fulfillment of God's great promise, that, the, that from his seed, the whole world will be blessed. And, and now, why is that twins somehow confusing to us in terms of God bringing about this? Well, it becomes confusing because, you know, anytime you throw another, another seed in the mix, another, another life in the mix, another male in this gene pool, you're like, well people could argue over who that was supposed to come from. And in fact, you can make the argument, well, Esau, having been the firstborn, right, shouldn't it come through him? But God goes ahead and prophesies beforehand to Rebekah that the older shall serve the younger. God just does things his own way, you know, and, and we're sometimes left confused. And I think that is an interesting thing for us to think about in this chapter because you're going to see Jacob confused, and Jacob struggled with his decisions. And if you remember last week, Rebecca, while still pregnant, as I just mentioned, she inquires as of the Lord as to what is going on inside her womb because she knows something's wrong. She's like, something's not right. You know, you, you women know that you've, you've had kids. If something's not right, you just know, you know, if something doesn't feel right. Now, in this case, we, we know what it is because the Lord, you know, responds and says, two nations two peoples, two systems of thought, two ideologies exist at the same time in your womb. And they're already fighting. Not much hope for their future, right? They're already fighting. And, and so she gets this prophetic word from the Lord, and he says, the older shall serve the younger. And, and then we wonder, well, why would the Lord allow that? Why wouldn't it just be just Jacob was born? It just seems confusing. We know that Esau came first, and, and right after being born, when Jacob's coming out, he grabs hold of his heel. That's how he got his name, Surplanter or, or Heel Catcher. And I find this an interesting correlation in the life of a Christian because the enemy, Satan, is always trying to steal the birthright of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? And, it, and, and as we see, we read about Esau more and more in the Scriptures, it actually says in Romans, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. It's pretty strong words. But why did God hate Esau? God hated Esau because Esau hated or cared not or cared nothing for God. And you're going to see that. I'm going to point that out as we go into this chapter a little bit today. If you've ever struggled with that, Esau cared nothing for his birthright. And and he traded his birthright for a bowl of porridge, red stew, As chapter 25 winds down, that's that moment where he has that moment of, of stupidity and relinquishes his birthright to his brother Jacob for some stew. A hungry belly, and he trades his birthright. Obviously, he didn't care about it. But for our purpose, we see in this story today three human temptations repeated in Isaac's life that should have already been he, he should have already known better of. So we're going to be back involved with Isaac this morning, and we're going to see him face three, three frustrations in his life, three temptations, three 
Three things that, that he's got to deal with that we're going to see that are repeated. And, and Abraham faced them, and now he's going to face them. The first of, of the three is, is the temptation to be led according to your circumstances. How many people can identify with that? Circumstances change. They get difficult around us, and we make decisions based on the circumstances, right? Well, he's going to be faced with that temptation. Secondly, the second temptation he's faced with is lying. And we're going to see what his motivation was for that, and we're going to see, you know, how he lied. And then the third temptation is manipulation. And it sort of goes right along with lying. But the problems and temptations are not new. And this is, I think, the whole point of this chapter for me is that, you know, these things aren't new things. We read this, and it's like ridiculous. It's like, didn't you learn this from your father? Abraham went through these same things. The same temptations, the same problems and circumstances our fathers, mothers, grandfathers, and grandmothers face are the same ones we face. True? And I think some of these we'll see that we actually are facing today. Do we learn from our mistakes? Do we learn from our parents' mistakes? Does Isaac display that he learned from Abraham? And I think we'll see that he does a little bit. But it's also he still makes the same mistakes. Let's get into the chapter, verse 1. Let's start with this idea of being led or being tempted to be led by our circumstances. Verse 1, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now keep in mind, at this point, Isaac is about 80 years old. And it, this was actually about 100 years after the famine that's mentioned here of Abraham. So quite a bit of time has passed since, uh, and I think we often forget that because we read these chapters come so quickly. And if we just read right through Genesis, it's like, bam, there we are. Wow, that just happened a couple chapters ago. And that was really, you were only reading three minutes, four minutes ago, and it just happened. Now it's happening again. And it was actually about 100 years between these two events. And now we see this, what seems to be the same character, Abimelech. But remember, that word Abimelech could, could be a name, proper name, because there were people that had that as a proper name, but it was also known to be a title, much like Pharaoh. So it, the Philistines, they would call their kings Abimelech, as, as the Egyptians would call their kings Pharaoh. So most likely, this is not the same guy that Abraham dealt with. Again, that was about 100 years ago. And although Isaac ultimately ends up in this situation of the, being tempted to, to act according to circumstances, he ends up doing well at the end of this tribal, trial. He doesn't start well. How can I say that? How do I say that? Well, famine hits, and the first thing Isaac does is what? He hits the road. Now, Gerar is where Abimelech dwells. That's where, he, that's where his headquarters is. And what we learned about Gerar, well, actually, we learned a lot about Gerar back in chapter 20, right, when Abraham went down there. But Gerar was a, a popular, uh, in the midst of a popular trade route between Palestine and Egypt. So it was, it was a lot of people in and out of uh, this town, and, uh, and, and they were, you know, bringing goods and, and things uh, back and forth between Palestine and and Egypt. And so, you know, what does that tell you? Well, things are getting tough up there in, in uh, Canaan, right? And, and the first thing he thinks of is, well, I know where there's food. Why is Egypt always the place where they go for food? Let me, let me just explain this a little bit of topo topography, which will help give you some, some understanding. When there's a drought in the land of Canaan, the crops suffer dramatically. The reason for that is the majority of their water for, for watering crops there comes directly from rainfall. So they're very much dependent on that rain for their crops. Egypt, on the other hand, really isn't. There's so many natural water sources there, rivers and such, that they can irrigate their fields and have their crops in spite of the fact that there isn't, you know, if they, if they don't have that natural rainfall. And so, you know, you have this, well, that's why you wonder, why, why Egypt? And we know, interestingly, later as we continue in the Bible, Egypt becomes a type in the Bible, doesn't it? Becomes a type of what? The world, right? And so this is the, 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 the incredible illustration for us is that when things get tough, when we have that temptation to be led according to our circumstances, automatically our minds, our human, our flesh is, is going to be the turn to the world, isn't it? Turn to the world for the answers because there's nothing else tangible around us. And that's something we just got to be careful of. Look at verse 2. The Lord steps in here to Isaac and he, and he appeared to him and said, Do not, 
Do not go down to Egypt. Instead, live in the land which I shall tell you. Canaan is the land that Isaac was called to live in. Gerar is as far um, south as you can get in Canaan without crossing over into Egypt. It's right there on the border. That, this is like, remember, I don't know if you remember this, but it's right around where the Gaza Strip is, not far from that area, right around that border area. Uh, and so it's like he's getting as close to the world as he can <laughs> without actually entering there. It's still obedience. He stops. The Lord stops him. He goes down to Gerar. It's as though we, we're not told that he was actually on his way to Egypt, in the world, if you will. But certainly he was tempted to, to run and turn and, and look for answers from the world, it seems. But the Lord stops him and he obeys. Now, we know that that didn't happen with Abraham. He actually went all the way down to Egypt. And that was the first time that he lied about Sarah, right? Verse 3, dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I, have, I give all these lands. And I will be perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And by the way, notice the I wills and the I and this God speaking about what he's going to do. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, Again, we saw Abraham make these, these very same failures we see Isaac making here. And yet, look at how God is speaking to him. Because he, Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And we have this, well, wait a minute. But he really didn't, did he? I mean, didn't he fail miserably at times too? Absolutely he did. And that's the encouraging thing for us is that we're going to have multiple failures over throughout our existence. When the circumstances crowd in around us, when the economic st non-stimulus package doesn't seem to help us, you know, we're, we're, not, we're, not looking, we're not looking to the world. We're not looking to the president for the answers to our problems. We're not. We have to look to the Lord and, and the Word as the answer to our problems. And, and, it, and it's a matter of trust, you guys. It's a matter of trust. It, it is for Abraham. It's a, it is for Isaac. And as we look at their circumstances, they're facing the same problems. They're, they're failing the same way. But God ultimately looks at us and He sees the big picture. Because he knows that what, in the midst of all this, he is forging faith in, his, in, in the faithful. Even when you seem faithless, he's at work forging faith in you. When you fail, God's at work doing something. That's what he's doing right here with Isaac. God forged faith in Abraham. And here in verse 5, he shares the glory with Abraham. Isn't that interesting? We've learned about all Abraham's failures, and now look what God says. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. He's sharing his glory with Abraham, and he does it throughout the Scriptures. Why? Well, because ultimately there came a time when, you know, when the Lord said, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to bring him a place where I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice him. And remember what happened the next morning? He got up early, saddled some, some camel, took camels, took, took some servants, brought his son, three days' walk to Mount Moriah, three days to, to, uh, to walk with his son, knowing that the end of the walk was going to be something that God told him to do, to sacrifice, to kill his own son. Right up until the point he grabbed the knife and raised the knife, and the, and the Lord showed up and said, stop. You know? And man, that's how the Lord works. He wants to forge faith in us. And, and, and the circumstances that, we, that, that, that tempt us to, to be led according to the circumstances or to lie as we're going to see or to manipulate, man, that's part of the process. Even when we fail, it's still part of the process. But we have to get back up, turn back to the Lord, and just as we're going to see, we have to worship. We have to worship. That's why our church is so important. This is the pl place that God has provided for us to worship and to serve. And we come here and we worship and we serve the Lord with or without our mistakes. Let's look at situation number two, the temptation to lie. It says in verse 6, So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Again, as close to Egypt as you can get without actually leaving Canaan, right? 
And men, of the, the men of the place asked about Rebekah, his wife, and he said, what's it say? She's my sister. Exactly. Thank you, Laura. Where have we seen that before? <laughs> Did I say it like you? A little more masculine. <sighs> Isn't it frustrating how, I, look, I just spent two weeks with my mom and my dad, and and uh, I love my mom and my dad very much. But what's so funny is I, I watched them and I see myself in them. And often it's things I don't like about myself that I see in them. Can you relate to this? Oh, man, I was like, oh, boy, I can't believe that. Look at that's where I got that from. <laughs> and I have a tremendous amount of respect for my parents. They, they love the Lord. They serve at their church. They, you know, God's doing work in their lives too. But, but, and, and that almost sounds like I'm... I'm I'm offending them by saying it, but you know what? We repeat, we repeat the same mistakes. We just do, and it's something we have to look out and, and be careful on. And, and, and now here, Isaac is doing the very same thing. He was afraid to say, she's my wife. He was afraid to say it because he thought, lest the men of this place kill me for Rebecca because she is beautiful to behold. The important thing that we need to understand with this instance here is it's not the sin itself that's the source of this failure. His motivation to lie came from fear of what might likely happen. And fear is the opposite of what? Faith, right? Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite. Let me use an, an, an alternate word here, trust, you know? When, when, when the situation arises and it begins to bring fear to our hearts, when we're even trying to protect the things that we love, you know, our wife, our kids, and, and we're motivated by fear to lie, it's still, it's still a bad thing. It's a terrible witness here is what it turns out to be again. Verse 8, now it came to pass, now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time. He'd been there a long time. A long time means that he was living a lie for a long time. Living a lie for a long time. You kind of feel sorry for Rebecca, don't you? It's like he's misrepresenting her to the people of the land. Her covering, her husband, is representing her as not being married, as not having a covering, not having a representation. After a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac, showing endearment to Rebecca, his wife. What does the King James say? Anybody have that? What's the word for endearment? Sporting? They weren't out there playing badminton, just so you know. <laughs> if you King James people, just so you know, it wasn't like a sporting event. Obviously, you could tell there was something intimate going on there. Googly eyes, you know, stroking the hair, whatever you think it might have been, holding hands, I don't know what it was, but obviously Abimelech got the picture. So Abimelech in verse 9 called Isaac and said, quite obviously she's your wife. So how could you say she's my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now, a couple interesting things about this. One is, you know, we're not told, but I wonder if, you know, these people, the descendants of the, the old Abimelech and, and the people who were alive at the last time this happened, you know, I wonder if they're, if they're sort of remembering this and knowing who, who Isaac is and so on and so forth. They're going, how can these same people do this to us again, you know? And they knew what happened last time, and, and yet they remembered how the Lord was with Abraham when this happened. Interesting. And it's also interesting that this, a, a pagan nation, a, a polytheistic pagan nation, this people, they still had this culturally accepted system of morality, and marriage was somehow sacred to them. You could see it right here in the text. I mean, Abimelech charges people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. The sanctity of marriage was important to these pagan people. Oh, how this country has fallen. Amen? We see that here their king, the pagan people, the king of the pagan people was more righteous on this issue than was 
Isaac, God's anointed. Now it says in verse 12 that Isaac sowed in that land and, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. And again, you're sitting here thinking, what? Why? What has he deserved immediately following verse you know, 11 and seeing all that he did in verses 8, 9, and 10? What happened in the midst of this? Are we missing some verses? Did he, is there a section missing in our Bibles that said, then he went and got on his knees before the Lord uh, for five years straight and, and, and prayed and, and sacrificed. And, and then Isaac sowed in the lamb, reaped the year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Wouldn't that make more sense to our fleshly minds? God does not bless because of you. He blesses in spite of you. And, and we can't do anything to earn or deserve God's blessing. God's blessing Isaac because that blessing is what God is going to use to bring about his promise. So God is doing what God needs to do in spite of his mistakes. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. God wants to bless you. And you know, here the blessing is giving him more money. You know, sometimes the blessing is taking money away. Did you know that? Because for some of us, the only way we're going to draw closer to the Lord, the only way we're going to truly worship is if we have less. And so, as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, I've learned how to do well, whether abased or abounding, whether well-fed or, you know, whether hungry, whether clothed or naked. I've learned contentment. I've, I've learned to worship in spite of what my circumstances are because my circumstances are likely to change, especially when I get to heaven, right? So, after all this blessing is poured out on him and all these possessions are obtained, the Philistines... And the end of verse 14, envied him. And now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with earth. So they brought out the back hose and, you know, they just kind of dumped all the sand in there. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us. Listen to this. For you are much mightier than we. It had become clear to Abimelech and the Philistines that if they did nothing that Literally, they'd be overcome by Isaac and all of his possessions and all of his peoples, right? Man, these people are there for some, there's something going on here that's just not right. It's just not normal. There's so much blessing. There's something supernatural. They recognize it. Later on, we're going to see that it motivates them to covenant with Isaac. But here we see that uh, they notice this and they actually feeling, feeling threatened by Isaac and his clan, asked him to leave. When Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and he dwelt there. Now, interesting thing about Isaac is he's like, okay, whatever. You know, let's just, let's keep the peace. Let's move somewhere else. You know, as long as we stay in Canaan, God's going to bless us. That's where God called us to be, right? And, and so there's like, you know, we, there's the temptation to say, you know what? Tough luck. You know, we're, we're, we've got, I've got all these people here for, remember, to pick up and move. Now, used to be, I talked about it about Abraham, Isaac too. He's acquired many people, much cattle, many things. And here he is, and he says, no problem. We'll pack up our little city, and we'll march out of town, and we'll start our own town. Because literally, he was a town in and of himself at this point. And so a very big deal to ask Isaac to take his people and move, and he does. You know what? Why fight it? Let's just go. Let's go do God's going to provide for us. We're going to be okay. And this is the right thing to do. 18. Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Now, a little bit of a different thing going on with this particular well. A well of running water is different than just a well. A running water is where there's a freshwater source, like a spring that continually feeds it. And what that means to them, this, in terms of wells, first of all, you've got to understand a well is an incredibly valuable thing. 
If you have a piece of property that has a well on it, that means a, that's a great deal of difference than if you live like in you know, Sierra Vista, Arizona, where there's nothing but tumbleweeds and no water for miles. They have this, you know, the San, San Pedro River out there, which at one time, I don't know if you guys know this, the San Pedro River through southern Arizona at one time had steam paddle boats going up and down it. And that was you know, back, I think, in the time of when, and, and we went to visit Tombstone again while we were there. We took Zoe down to Tombstone. And that wasn't far from Tombstone. You know, it was, uh, they used to drag, uh, drag um, all, their, all the silver out of the mines. They would drag it from Tombstone down to the San Pedro to, to wash it and, and separate the, the, the purity of the metals from, from all the iron ore and all that stuff. But the San Pedro today is gone. It's underground. You can look across the valley and you see this this like winding uh, row of, of healthy trees, you know, and the rest above it is all, like I said, tumbleweeds. It's mesquite, a lot of mesquite, a lot of cactus and all that stuff where my parents live. But the San Pedro runs, runs right through the middle of the valley between the Huachuca Mountains and, you know, you look all the way across the valley, there's the dragoons in the long distance over there. And, and it's a fascinating place, but somewhere, and I, I don't remember when it was, but there was this massive earthquake and the river, the San Pedro, went underground. And occasionally during the rainy season, it's, you know, it fills up and it's above ground again. But most of the summer or after, you know, after the uh, monsoon season, it's all dry. But this well was a special well because it was running water. It had a continuous source of water. And you can imagine out there in the desert like Arizona, having fresh water would be a, a pretty important thing, right? An entire city would pop up just because of a water source. And so this, was a, this particular well was an important one. And, but look what happens. Of course, other people in the land are going to want that water source, aren't they? And when you have a source of quote-unquote water, whatever that might be in your time of distress, whatever, whatever dryness there might be, whether it's financial or spiritual or whatever, and, and, and that's going on around you, but you have this great source of something different, it becomes appealing to the people around you. Now, in this case, they take it away from him. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of this well Essek because they quarreled with him. Essek uh, meant dispute or contention. And so they called it dispute or contention. And again, you know, he moves on. He says, fine, take it. You want it? Take it. Now that's interesting. As Christians, it's like, you know what? I've got this incredible source, whatever it might be. And, and, and I'm going to give it up. It's the very thing that I value and need. It's so important to me. And I'm going to give it up to this, you know, Philistine, this God-hater. Maybe that's what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 21, then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. Sitna meant opposition or enmity. And en enmity is that word like angst, or, you know, it's like, a, you know, it's like that whole battle thing, opposition. And, and, and so they, they named the well Sitna, and then they moved on from there. They said, all right, fine, take that too. And then they dug another well. And at this point, verse 22, they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, which meant room, because for now the Lord has made room for us, and we dwelt, we shall be fruitful in the land. And so, it, you know, this was how he determined this was the spot. Because they dug this well, they dug one well was incredibly valuable, and he said, "You know what? We put all that work into it. Let it go. It's not ours. We want to find. We want peace. We're, we're going to find a place where we can dwell peacefully." It's funny how now Israel has no peace in their own land. Verse twenty-three, and then he went up there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him in the same night and said, "I am the Lord God of your father Abraham." Now. If there's, if there's a spot in this chapter that you want to underline that sort of answers all the objections, that, you know, the lying, the manipulation, the being led by our circumstances, this is the spot you want to underline right here. Do not fear, and then he even gives a reason why you shouldn't fear. For I am with you. Do not fear, for I'm with you. Has anybody ever read Joshua chapter 1? And, and some subsequent chapters there. And maybe that'll be your homework this week. <laughs> Check that out. See how many times the Lord tells Joshua not to fear. Because why? Because I'm with you. And if God's with you, who can be against you? Paul said in Romans 8. 
If God be with you, who can be against you? And it's our, it's our, it's, it's our faith. It's how much we actually buy into that in our hearts and in our minds that actually will change how it manifests itself. Our actions will follow what we believe, folks. Our actions will follow what we believe. That's why you can absolutely be sure that your identity is dependent on what you believe. You are what you believe, period. If you, if you look at this and you say, this is absolute truth from, from cover to cover, and what it says goes, and my life is going to be changed because of it, I'm not going to change the meaning based on what my life says or what I like to do, but I'm going to submit and surrender to it, and whatever the consequences are, that's how I'm going to live. Even if, you know, my life... My life's dreams change because I surrender to the truths in it. Even if that's the case, I'm just going to go with that. And that's why when people be- become consumed by- with faith and they-, and they trust the Lord and they take His Word at its literal meaning and they apply it to their lives, the outcome is a person of faith. And you know, the people of, you want to know what a person of faith looks like? They're the greatest servants in the church. They point the least to themselves. They give the most of themselves because they know what they're doing. They're investing in eternity. They're not trying to provide for themselves here or now. They want to serve the Lord. They want to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. That's what they want. They care more about that than anything. And they lay aside all their personal, quote, unquote, rights. They lay aside all their dreams, all their worldly stuff. They lay it aside and they say, you know what? None of that means anything. The Lord has called me by name. And I think Isaac gives us a great example. He, he keeps moving on until there's room for him. Not trusting in the running water. I, listen, I'd have been tempted to say, you know what? I've already moved far enough. This is where we dug this well. We put this work into it. Sorry, you guys are just going to have to deal with this. That's probably what I would have done. You know, we've all plopped down. We've cast our tents. We're done. We're staying here. But he didn't. He moved on. He found a place where there was room. Rehoboth was the name of the well. And verse 25 says, so he built. Listen, this is important. This is important. Underline this also. I lied. There's another spot you can can underline. So he built an altar there. And he called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. There Isaac's servants dug a well. When you find that place where God has made room for you in this world, whatever that is, that's where you worship. You build your altar. You you pitch your tent. And and then you bloom. Bloom where you're planted. God brings you there. He brought you there. You know, worship. We've, you know, uh, I was communicating via the internet, email, back and forth uh, with a guy who I knew from the Bible college. I was teaching. He was one of my students out there when I was teaching the book of Matthew. And, and um, he got back in touch with me because of one of, you know, Facebook, the social utility. By the way, if you're not on Facebook, we actually have a group, Jersey Shore Calvary Fellowship. That if you're a member, you can join that. It's pretty cool. I'm, I'm writing about prayer. And you guys who are members, go on there and read what I wrote about prayer. And comment back, please. I'd like that. But um, anyway, he got back in touch with me. And, and and he blew, while I was out in Arizona, I read the things he said, and I was like blown away. And twice the Lord did this for me out there, really encouraged me. He brought two people from my past back into my life who pointed out things that they learned from watching me that I had never knew the Lord did. He, he, he wrote about um, two, two memories that he had of me. Once was outside, outside the, the, the classroom that I was teaching my Matthew class. He'd come up to me and he said, John, what's the Lord showing you? And then he repeated almost verbatim the things that I said. I was like, oh my goodness, when was that, hon? 2004? 2004? So, you know, what was that? Uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, right? <laughs> I wish. But he remembered it and it made an impression on him. And then he said there was another moment and, and he thought it was funny because he, he, he described what I was wearing. And I was, at the time, one of my, I, taught, I was given the privilege of teaching there being faculty, but the res- my responsibility was overseeing a department at the school. I oversaw the AV department, and I did conferences, and I did the Bible college. So I had, I had a couple staff people, plus I was assigned a bunch of students to make sure all the work on campus got done, whether it was 
providing live sound support for the conferences or whatever we did. We did a lot of different stuff. It was a lot of fun. But he saw me one day walking across campus. He said, you were wearing a red collared shirt. I can't for the life of me remember. I think I remember which one it was. And he said, you were wearing flip flops and you were wearing this and you were wearing that. And you had your radio on with the thing on your, uh, you know, the, the microphone clipped to your shoulder and you didn't have your, your golf cart. So you were walking. And I just remember the Lord gave me some words as I looked at you and he said it was free to serve free to serve. Free to serve is what he remembered from that. That was, that was this vision he had of me. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. So cool because he said not, not with a suit and a tie, not with, you know, not with a uniform, not, not with a military uniform, not with a shield and a sword. He said, but just with flip-flops and, and my, you know, my casual red shirt and my, my, and my microphone and my, my radio, I'm just out there ready for that day to do whatever the Lord called me to do. And I thought, what a testimony. That was so cool. That was what God gave me in the faith that I had in that day, the freedom to do whatever God had for me that day. And that's what he saw. And I'm thinking, well, how encouraging is that? The Lord had did that in my life. And it also came with many failures, and he knew about some of them too, I'm sure. But here is Isaac you know, free to do what he wants. He's, he, he's, he's mightier than, than the Philistines. He could have done whatever he wanted. He could have said, no, we're staying here. But he had the freedom of heart and the trust and the faith to move on, you know, and, and to go find a place where the Lord had made room for him. And he built an altar there, and he worshiped, and he called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Verse 26. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, I think that's as best I'm going to do today. One of his friends, Fecal, the commander of his army, and Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We've certainly seen that the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Wow. There's the testimony. God's poured out the blessing and he has shown faith and trust in not trying to approach things in a worldly way or a fleshly way. Instead, he's just said, you know what, fine. You have that well, you have that well, we'll just keep moving along. He, Abimelech already admitted, look, you've become more powerful and more mighty than us. Didn't have to move in the first place. He's, he, he's seen they, these people, the Philistines, they've seen God pour out blessing upon blessing on him. And, and, they, and now they recognize something is different. The Lord's, we see that the Lord's blessed you. Your God is mightier than ours. And so, you know, but, but he says, why when you hate us? And, the, and he said, well, we've seen that the Lord is, is with you. And so we said, we continue in verse 28, let there now be an oath or a covenant between us and let us make this covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you. Well, we kind of stopped up your wells, but, you know, we took some wells from you. We didn't touch you. And since we've done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace, you are now blessed of the Lord. I kind of look at this this way. You know, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer, right? You know, it's like <laughs> from Isaac's perspective, you know what? I'll keep an open line of communication with them and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll make this agreement with them. I'm not going to hurt them, you know. And I, and I don't think, he, I don't think you know, that this is necessarily all, all that bad a thing, but he, he keeps peace in the land. Verse 30, and he makes a feast and they ate and they drank. And they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass in the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug. And they said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba, for the name of this city is Be'er Sheba to this day. To this day. And so, you know, there, now God is just pouring out more blessing, more blessing. He's got, you know, he's almost guaranteed peace now. Uh, and, and he has another well. And then Esau here in verse 34, we turn our attention and we find out what's going on with his brother Esau. He was 40 years old and he took wives, uh, Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And look at this, verse 35. They were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebecca. They're kind of going, there goes the family. You know, brother Esau is out there drawing wives from pagan idolaters, Hittite people. 
It's polluting, if you will, the faith of the people of God. Esau, obviously by this, cares nothing for the God of his father. He's willing to just go and marry these women who, who uh, know nothing of the Lord, care nothing for the Lord. They're just uh, from a pagan worshiping family. Listen, missionary dating doesn't work. Maybe it does by accident sometimes, but if you're, you know, if you're a single person you know, and, and you're hoping to be married someday, again, I, I'll say this again, I believe God chooses your spouse. And, and I, listen, I don't, I don't want to be insensitive because I, I didn't get married until I was 36 or 7. 26 or 7, was it? 17? I can't remember. Anyway, you know, when you get older, I guess your mind goes. But... Um, uh, and I'm not portraying myself as being patient because I think there'd be, there were people around me back then that would say, yeah, right, patient. You know, I, I certainly had my share of failures. I did. And, and uh, you know, and, but the best thing you can do is, is um, whether it's spouses or whether it's money or whatever it is, is wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. You know, let the Lord do things in His time, in His way. Because you know why? That way you can look back and say, I didn't do that. I, had, I didn't have my hands on that. I had nothing to do with it. It was God's doing. And you can have faith in that. You, could, you can have confidence and trust in that. God's shaping your character. Are you willing to wait? He allows temptation to come in. You know what? We're going to have communion today. So let's end there. We'll, we'll get to uh, manipulation next week.